Hello and welcome to chapter 11 of Wuthering Heights. I am Lee Bronte. We're doing our discussion and analysis, continuing from last time. Don't forget to like and subscribe and notification bell and comment. And I'll say in advance, thank you for listening and also watching as we now launch into chapter 11. So it follows on immediately from the last chapter. And you've got nearly concerned about Heathcliff's return and what he's going to do and the danger that he poses and effectively the immorality and danger that he represents to Catherine and Edgar Linton's marriage. She's not a great fan of Catherine, of course, as I think most of us aren't really when we think about it. So the only thing I really noticed on this early part here of the chapter was I thought, well, it's interesting about the connotations of got up in a sudden terror. In some ways, it reminds me of Lockwood's nightmare as well. So I think it's a deliberate uh, reference back to that in a very subtle way. But then also, it's just, again, got this continuing from this idea we had in the last chapter about Heathcliff as a dangerous predator. So it all connects. So not too much for that page. So I've picked out a few things here as we go through it. So Nelly thinks that she should return to Wuthering Heights and warn Heathcliff about what he's doing and how he's perceived and how dangerous this pathway is that he's taking. I uh, thought it was an interesting way of describing Wuthering Heights, interesting adjective of the dismal house because it's such a depressing, awful place. And you have Nelly making regular attempts to go there. You know, it was about the period that my narrative has reached a bright frosty afternoon, the ground bare and the road hard and dry. So more nature references and the idea here of it's a very kind of barren landscape as well, isn't it? Then we see I highlighted this just because these are Wuthering Heights, Strosscross Grange and Gimmerton as your main locations. We only normally hear about Gimmerton. Uh, there are a few bits where it's set down by the church and the churchyard and everything, but most of the novels across these two and the moors. But there's a signpost there, so locating everything where it is. Then we have Nelly have a kind of nostalgic moment. A gush of child sensations floated to my heart. Hindley and I, Hindley and I held it as a favourite spot 20 years before. So Nelly with Hindley must have been when she was looking after him i think she's older i don't think she's about the same age but anyway there's some kind of connection there anyway i don't think it's romantic necessarily but as children playing together i always imagine nelly is older but of course going back into the past they probably would have been about a similar age then they've collected lots of natural things snail shells pebbles we are fond of storing there with more perishable things. And this is an interesting one because there's a sense of um, time in the novel as well. And so on the moors, time seems to work differently. So she still finds objects that she placed there as a child with Hindley. Obviously, this is still a, effectively a memory she's talking about of when she went up there all those years ago. But there's a sense of timelessness about the moors. Then... As she's thinking about this, and as fresh as reality, it appeared that I beheld my early playmate seated on the withered turf. Poor Hindley, I exclaimed involuntarily. involuntarily. I started my bodily eye was cheated into a momentary belief that the child lifted its face and stared straight into mine. It vanished in a twinkling. So what's happening here is it looks like she's having a vision of the past of seeing young Hindley, but... She's also then worried, again, this is a good theme for the supernatural, but superstition urged me to comply with the impulse, as in to go up to Wuthering Heights, thinking she's had a vision that it's a premonition that Hindley's going to be dead, and so seeing the ghost of him as a child is a signal that he's died. But actually, what happens is, the nearer I got to the house, the more agitated I grew, and catching sight of it, I trembled every limb. The apparition more supernatural Lexis there, had outstripped me. It stood looking through the gate. So it turns out not to be a supernatural vision. This is actually Hareton looking like his father did when he was a child as well. Uh, again, we've got more kind of supernatural Lexis of elf locked. The idea of his hair must be very long, a bit like a kind of Tolkien type Lord of the Rings kind of elf hair rather than your Santa type of elf. Then we have... 
an interesting interaction here. God bless thee, darling, I cried, forgetting instantaneously my foolish fears. Hareton, it's Nelly, Nelly thy nurse. And remember, Nelly was very attached to young Hareton. She effectively raised him. So this is quite an interesting uh, response here. He picked up a large flint. I am come to see my father, Hareton. <laughs> he actually hurls it at, he hurls the piece of rock, the flint. He hurt Nelly. Uh, the stone struck my bonnet and then ensued from the stammering lips of the little fellow a string of curses which, whether he comprehended them or not, were delivered with practised emphasis and distorted his baby features into a shocking expression of malignity. So Nellie's got some kind of quite educated Lexus brunt he's given her here. But the idea is, is that Hareton is really swearing at her. He's giving her a lot of... He's thrown a rock at her and he's swearing at her is what's happening now. So again, this isn't what she would expect from a child she'd effectively raised. Who has taught you those fine words, my Ben? I inquired. The curate, that's sarcastic, because the curate is obviously, he's like a, he's attached to the church like a vicar, so the curate wouldn't really do that. Damn the curate and thee. Give me, give me that, he replied. So, and he's referring there to, she's trying to offer him an orange to kind of soothe his, soothe his mood, effectively. Who's your master? Devil Daddy was his answer. I like, Devil Daddy. And he means Hindley. So again, we've talked before about Wuthering Heights and its association with hell. Bronte presents it like that. You know, the fireplace, the dogs, the danger, the darkness. There's obviously a lot of darkness around shadowy corners, guns, violence. And now, ultimately, we've got Hindley being compared to and described by Hareton as Devil Daddy. So that really hammers it home, doesn't it, really? It really emphasises the hellish qualities of Wuthering Heights. So remember, right at the start of the novel, back in chapter one, Lockwood, as narrator, commented on the bent-over branches uh, of Wuthering Heights. We said there's a consistent theme in the novel of how children are raised, like their childhood, how it shapes them into adulthood. So look what's happening to Hareton here. He's gone from being very close to Nelly, being very affectionate to now because of the neglect he's experienced from his father. And actually, it's also Heathcliff's influence as well in a different way. He's now becoming aggressive, violent, ill-tempered and abusive himself. So you've got uh, Devil Daddy. Daddy cannot buy me because I swear at him. Ah, and the devil teaches you to swear at Daddy, I observed. I nay, he drawled. And who then? Heathcliff. So Heathcliff has been training Hareton up to, he's been teaching him his favourite swear words so he can abuse Hindley. So obviously Heathcliff has been long crafting his revenge and I would assume creating a deliberate, there was always a rift really between Hareton and Hindley, but really emphasising that is an aspect of that revenge. I asked if he liked Mr Heathcliff, I. He pays dad back what he gives to me, he curses daddy for cursing me, so... Heathcliff defends Hareton, and this explains what we've already seen in the novel, which is later on in the timeline, of course, where Hareton is very attached to Heathcliff. So we have more here as well. This is actually this is too too controversial to be printed at the time, so the missing words we don't know. Now I was told the curate he should have his insert your own swear word, teeth dash down his insert your another swear word or the same one throat if he stepped over the threshold he could have promised that and if you're thinking that a particular swear word you're thinking of didn't exist then it did exist then so yeah so it probably is the one you're th imagining it might not be but again youtube can't say anyway so he's visiting the heights and more supernatural exorcists feeling as scared as nearly goes in feeling as scared as if i had raised a goblin he 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 a goblin impression. Then we had, there was enough, another rapid glance at the house and supposing himself unseen, the scoundrel had the impudence to embrace her. So this actually now shifts to, I've highlighted here because this is Heathcliff continues to visit and Nelly had decided to get out of there. It's not worth the danger of visiting Wuthering Heights. It's far too dangerous for her on her own to go visiting. So she changes her mind. She goes back and she then recounts this time. The next time Heathcliff came, 
Heathcliff is seizing his opportunity with Isabella. So the scoundrel, look at the, that's a pejorative term used to describe him as well there. And Judas traitor, I ejaculated, you are a hypocrite too, are you? A deliberate deceiver. Because obviously she's aware that Heathcliff isn't really interested in Isabella. But of course Heathcliff is interested in her money and also as a way of getting back at Edgar Linton, whom he hates. Then I wonder if the heart to find a plausible excuse for making love to Miss. Making love really in those days just means romancing before you get too carried away in your imagination. I mean, you could interpret it that way if you want to go down a kind of racier route with it, but really it just means like romance. Then to hear you, people might think you were the mistress, she cried. This is Catherine objecting to Nellie's objections. So she says, I couldn't withhold giving some loose to my indignation because Heathcliff's allowed in and Catherine doesn't like this idea of Nellie moving beyond her servant station. She thinks she's overstepping the mark actively. Then about Linton drawing the bolts against you, as in like locking him out. God forbid that he should try, answered the black villain. Interesting, isn't it? Black villain. Very ambiguous, we've said before, about ethnicity. Again, country folk, English country folk, white English country folk in this era, they would be very ignorant about different ethnicities. So again, it's open to your interpretation. Then I detested him just then. God keep God keeping me impatient. Every day I grow madder after sending him to heaven. Now that means, that one you have to kind of interpret slightly differently to how we see it. He doesn't mean uh, he he's after doesn't mean that he has killed Edgar Linton. It means that it's something that he's want to do. It's like when you say you're after something, you know. So I, I'm after a a nice cake to have for my birthday party. That's a weird example. I'm, I'm I know, but you know it's when you're after something. It's like that that sense of after. So he's like desirous every day. I grow mad at after sending him to heaven. It means every day. He feels like he really wants to kill him, is what Heathcliff is saying there. What Bronte has Heathcliff saying there again. So again, the theme of violence, aggression, jealousy. Then, don't vex me, why have you described my request? Did she come across you on purpose? So Catherine is, there's themes of jealousy because of Heathcliff with Isabella. Was it to you, he growled, I have a right to kiss her if she chooses and you have no right to object. I am not your husband. You needn't be jealous of me. So interesting use of pragmatics here, which is context and implied meanings. But look at the italics, look at the emphasis. We have Heathcliff really, or Bronte there is suggesting that I am not your husband. He's actually, Heathcliff is using that as an attack on Catherine's own marriage and resentment there and jealousy is coming through as well. Then I want you to be aware that I know you have treated me infernally. Infernally. So you've got a bit of epizuxis there for the emphasis. Then if you're not sure of that term, it just means repetition, actually, of the same word. Then, again, infernal has got connotations of hell as well. So this is Heathcliff feeling that he's been very badly treated by Catherine. Particularly, really, it's just about marrying Edgar Linton, choosing him over... Heathcliff. I should have said that the other way around, but you know what I mean. Then you're a fool if you think I can be consoled by sweet words. You are an idiot. And if you fancy I'll suffer unrevenged, I'll convince you of the contrary in a very little while. Meantime, thank you for telling me your sister-in-law's secret. I swear I'll make the most of it. Isn't that interesting? I swear I'll make the most of it as well. So Heathcliff as a character, he's opportunistic, he's cunning, he's manipulative. So he's going to exploit the Isabella affection to his own game. Then we have, I picked this out because I thought this was interesting. The tyrant grinds down his slaves and they don't turn against him. They crush those beneath them. So there's an idea of Heathcliff's philosophy here. It is also a reference to obviously slavery in the era. Slavery still existed, of course. 
it's just a little mention of it but the idea is the philosophy is the tyrant who grinds down his slaves the slaves don't rebel they take out their their anger on people beneath them that's what he means so it's how like it's often how like bullies work isn't it the bullied well the bullies have been bullied themselves you know it's often a pattern as it's passed down it's passed down to different people then having leveled my palace don't erect a hovel and complacently admire your own charity and giving me that for a home so that's a little analogy there remember catherine had this idea of uh she thought she thought getting married to or she convinced herself that getting married to edgar linton she could protect and look after heathcliff and make sure he was okay but really it was essentially for her own selfish reasons obviously but you've got that analogy there a hovel is like a ramshackle house isn't it and saying well you know he's comparing himself leveled my palace you could have been with me is what heathcliff is saying and now you think you know you're with edgar linton and he's not you destroyed me and then you're offering me a hovel in return it's not good enough so it's just an analogy if I imagined you really wished me to marry Isabel, I'd cut my throat. So, again, showing that his interest in Isabella isn't out of love at all. Oh, the evil is not, I am not jealous, is it? cried Catherine. Well, I won't repeat my offer of a wife. It is as bad as offering Satan a lost soul. So, we have a simile here again and more hell references, more satanic imagery as well. And the idea of Heathcliff as a devil here as well. Or as the devil. Then, where do we go? There's other things you could say, but I'm just picking out some of my favourites here. Nellie actually ends up telling Mr Linton himself. And I rated the scene in the court, and as near as I did, the whole subsequent dispute. When Mr Linton returns from business, his business probably in court presiding over court she tells him what she can about the whole thing hence edgar linton's reaction this is insufferable he exclaimed it is disgraceful that she should own him for a friend and force his company on me call me two men out of the hall ellen catherine shall linger no longer to argue with the low ruffian i have humoured her enough so bronte's really establishing this chapter's big theme really is going to be jealousy isn't it there's a lot of you can see another key theme of the novel jealousy We've got it from all quarters here. We've got it from Heathcliff, we've got it from Catherine, we've got it from Edgar Linton as well. Edgar Linton is now gathering up some servants to forcibly, physically eject Heathcliff from Thrushcross Grange. So that's where we're going with that. Then, how is this Ed Linton addressing her? What notion of propriety must ha you have to remain here after the language of which has been held to you by that blackguard? And again, that's another pejorative term describe describing Heathcliff it's a essentially a bad person blackguard is a, it's an archaic word we don't use anymore but again interesting like connotations of darkness and potentially ethnicity as well you possibly could link it to then we have I have been so far forbearing with you, sir. Notice the courteous language from Edgar Linton. Not that I was ignorant of your miserable, degraded character, but I felt you were only partially responsible, or so partly responsible for that. So that's, again, we talked about upbringings, shaping characters. And so Heathcliff here, well, sorry, Edgar Linton acknowledges Heathcliff's past, saying, well, I knew you were a bad person, but I didn't necessarily blame you for it because i knew what you'd suffered growing up so that made some sense however you are an awful person and i can't put up with you anymore then your presence is a moral poison as a metaphor that would contaminate the most virtuous uh, i i shall deny you here after admission into this house and give notice now that i require your instant departure three minutes delay will render it involuntary and ignominious so he's going to physically have him chucked out by the servants so if you don't get out right now great line here kathy this lamb of yours threatens like a bull so nice simile nice animal references notice edgar linton it's a lamb where we have heathcliff is like a wolf predator and obviously a bull is a more aggressive creature as well it is in danger of splitting its skull against my knuckles so heathcliff here bronte has it so heathcliff 
is using these impersonal pronouns. So it again kind of dehumanizes Edgar Linton. It 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 makes Heathcliff very aware that Edgar Linton can't really threaten him. He's not really going to hurt him. He's unable to. So you have this: he's in danger of splitting its skull against my knuckles, which is a kind of euphemistic way of describing that he's going to punch him in the face. By God, Mr Linton, I'm mortally sorry that you are not worth knocking down, so you're not even worth having a fight with. Because obviously Heathcliff is more powerful, stronger. Just, yeah, just... <laughs> Edgar Linton would probably get knocked down by a slight gust of wind. Then Heathcliff would assume lift a finger at you as the king would march his army against the colony of mice. Cheer up, you shan't be hurt. Your type is not a lamb. It's a sucking leveret. And leveret is a young hare. So, not a lamb. It's a sucking leveret. So, actually, like a baby. A baby a hare is a, you know, it's like a, it's like an enhanced rabbit. <laughs> In real life, it's like, they're like bigger, tougher versions of, of, uh, of rabbits. But he's like that. So, again, more of the animal references. Heathcliff couldn't hurt him because, you know, the king wouldn't send an army against the colony of mice. But look how these two, Bronte's comparing and framing these two men and the animal words that are chosen, giving a sense of strength and weakness. It's really interesting, isn't it, like that? And that is the slavering, shivering thing you preferred to me. That's Heathcliff dismissing Edgar Linton because Edgar Linton's got himself all worked up and he's all scared. I would not strike him with my fist but I'll kick him with my foot and experience considerable satisfaction. So, so he's not even worth punching, but he'd quite happily kick him. Is he weeping or is he going to faint for fear? My master quickly sprang erect and struck him full on the throat, a blow that would have levelled a slighter man. So Edgar Linton actually is motivated to try and hit Heathcliff, but it doesn't really hurt Heathcliff. It just kind of bounces off him. He took his breath for a minute, and while he choked, Mr Linton walked out by the back door into the yard and from thence to the front entrance. Do you suppose I'm going, I'm going with that blow burning in my gullet? He thundered, that's Heathcliff. By hell no, I'll crush his ribs in like a rotten hazelnut. Nice simile there, again drawing on natural imagery, but connotations of fragility there, because Edgar Linton isn't, as we've seen, he's not a tough guy. If I don't floor him now, I shall murder him sometime. So as you value his existence, let me get at him. So he wants to return the favour of when he's been hit. But when Heathcliff realises that three servants are coming to deal with him, he works out the odds there and he effectively leaves. So he smashes his way up with the poker from the fire, actually. He smashes the lock and... Off he goes. So we have Catherine. I'm nearly distracted, Nelly. She exclaimed, throwing herself on the sofa. A thousand smith's hammers are beating in my head. So hyperbole for having a really big headache there. Tell Isabella to shun me. This uproar is owing to her. <laughs> uh, hang on, Catherine. Mm. So she's blaming Isabella for it. But surely Catherine and Heathcliff are to blame for this. And particularly her, really. And Delhi, say to Edgar, if you see him again tonight, that I'm in a danger of being seriously ill. I wish it may prove true. So she's going to fake an illness just to get sympathy from Edgar Linton. Catherine is not a nice person, is she at all? Like, let's face it. He has startled and distressed me shockingly. I want to frighten him. <laughs> so... So she's doing that to create sympathy. Well, if I cannot keep Heathcliff for my friend, if Edgar will be mean and jealous, I'll try to break their hearts by breaking my own. That will be a prompt way of finishing it all when I am pushed to extremity. So her idea to get revenge on them. So again, another theme of the novel, theme of revenge. So Bronte sets it up here where you've got Catherine has decided to say, I'm going to make myself ill and I'm going to get back at them that way and upset both of them, Heathcliff and Linton. Then I've got a note here. I took the liberty of turning back to listen whether they would resume their quarrel together. This is Nellie listening at the door. Like she obviously she's very well informed, isn't she? So obviously she does a lot of snooping. So you could say here that Bronte is careful to frame 
Nelly in ways where she can access all the information that we need to be told the actual narrative then your cold blood cannot be worked into a fever your veins are full of ice water but mine are boiling and the sight of such chillness makes them dance so look at this childish behavior here as well mistress stamping her foot so the idea of she's making herself ill deliberately and Edgar Linton wants her to give up Heathcliff. Will you give up Heathcliff hereafter or will you give up me? So it's an ultimatum. And again, there's a theme here of this kind of relationship that Catherine thinks she can have with Heathcliff when she's married. When Edgar Linton doesn't even like Heathcliff and Heathcliff is a violent, dangerous abuser himself. I mean, this this is just cannot work. There's a real core selfishness about Catherine's character this is just it's fantasy land if she thinks she can make this relationship work so this is what Bronte is presenting we can see it as the reader we're meant to be horrified by this confused but we can just tell these aren't sympathetic characters deliberately we aren't meant to think they're nice people we're meant to look at them and think no this is all wrong this is just not working you could decide to say, who do you think is the most to blame out of all of this? There's plenty of different ways you can look at it. For me right now, looking at the novel as I'm doing these, going through each chapter in detail, it makes me think, yeah, Catherine, often she, I mean, Heathcliff is awful, but a lot of the time Catherine is just as bad sometimes or worse. Isn't it? They're very similar. They are well suited to each other because they are both horrible people, Catherine and Heathcliff. Then... You have, there she lay dashing her head against the arm of the sofa and grinding her teeth that she, you might fancy she would crash them to splinters. So Bronte uses hyperbole there, but the idea of Catherine is putting on this for sympathy. In a few seconds, she stretched herself out stiff and turned up her eyes while her cheeks at once blanched and livid assumed the aspect of death. This does foreshadow her death, of course. So she is going to make herself ill and she is going to actually then, she dies as a result. <laughs> so Nelly gives it away to Edgar Linton. There is nothing in the world the matter, I whispered. I did not want him to yield, and though I could not help being afraid in my heart. She has blood on her lips, he said, shuddering. Never mind, I answered tartly. And I told him how she had resolved, previous to his coming on, exhibiting a fit of frenzy. So, fortunately, Nelly reveals to Edgar Linton, she's faking this. And I cautiously gave the account aloud and she heard me for she started up. So she gives away that she's uh, not ill. I made up my mind for broken bones at least, but she only glared about for an instant. So Nelly again, fearing violence against her person there from Catherine. The master directed me to follow. I did by to her chamber door. She hindered me from going further by securing it against me. So Nelly reveals that Catherine is faking an illness just to get Edgar Linton's attention. She never offered to descend to breakfast next morning. I went to ask whether she would have some carried up. No, she replied peremptorily. The same question was repeated at dinner and tea and again on the morrow after and received the same answer. So she's not eating. So here's a sign of things to come as well. A solemn warning that if she was so insane as to encourage that worthless suitor, it would dissolve all bonds of relationship between herself and him. So that's Edgar Linton again re-emphasising his ultimatum so it's a similar way to how Heathcliff came in at the earliest part of his uh, journey and I was a child coming into um, Wuthering Heights and disrupting the family there and causing jealousy in that case it was Hindley wasn't it about his father's affections in this second main phase of the novel here after Heathcliff's return you get Heathcliff causing disruption in this marriage now because of his he's come back. But as I say, you could really just interpret it as it's Catherine really has generated this situation. You can argue, can't you, as well? But you can argue it's all connected. It's all part of the same thing. Catherine described herself as having the same soul as Heathcliff. They are very similar. They're both vile people. So that is the end of chapter 11. I hope you've enjoyed that, found it useful. Keep up, keep going with your reading, have a look, see what you find yourself. You can put it in the comments if you've got anything interesting. You don't have to agree with what I say. 
I'm open to new ideas and you're very welcome to your own ideas as well. Thank you for listening. So I'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.